I'm excited to share with you all what Excel's doing um, in terms of asset performance management and digital transformation. Uh, I don't want to stand up here and say that Excel's got it all figured out. We're still very early on in this journey, and you'll see that in this presentation. But we've learned a lot, uh, specifically in the last three years. Uh, we've really changed course, and we're gaining a lot of momentum. Uh, we've learned a lot of what to do and what not to do. Um, and I believe we're on a really, really good path for success. So that's the story that I want to share with you all today. Um, I'm hoping getting out of this as well that we're able to connect, right? I know a lot of you are also on this journey. There's a lot that we can learn from you, so I'm very excited to make some of those connections this week. All right, so what are we going to talk about? I'll start with a, just a background on Excel Energy, um, and then I'll go into a background on asset performance management. So we've heard in the last couple of days a lot of snippets of how people are using GEAPM or different digital solutions, but we haven't really talked about kind of the fundamentals of APM and what that is. And so I want to ground us today a little bit and talk about the methodologies, the principles behind a lot of what we've been talking about in the last couple of days. I'll also cover a timeline um, for Excel. Um, specifically kind of in the last three years and then moving forward what our roadmap looks like. I'll cover what we're doing in terms of instrumentation expansion, um, some examples of what we've built in the GE APM software. Um, I want to talk about the workflow that we are currently adopting in Excel to utilize more data, more risk information on a regular basis to really influence the decisions we make around maintenance. Um, and then I'll end with lessons learned, you know, what we've learned recently, um, and I'll leave time for questions at the end. All right, so let's get started here. So a little background on Excel. Uh, we are a regulated utility that provides electricity and natural gas supply. Uh, we serve customers across eight states. Uh, we have a map on the right there. Primarily Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, um, Minnesota, Wisconsin area. Over on the left in the, in the pie chart there, you can see really our generation portfolio. Um, this, this slide I think is about a year old. And so that, that portion in blue, which is our wind generation, seems to be growing daily within Excel. Um, so, like many of you, we're going through a significant transition right now. We're adding more renewable generation to our portfolio. We have very aggressive goals to reduce carbon emissions by 80% by 2030, and then full reduction of carbon emissions by 2050. We are in a very good service area for wind generation. Um, some of those states that we uh, provide to our customers, that is some of the windiest territory in the US. So that really sets us up for a good spot in Excel to move to more wind generation. But as many of us in this room know, that creates a lot of challenges for our business. Uh, we're gonna be shutting down a lot of our coal plants, if not all of them, by 2030. But between now and then, we have to make sure that those plants and those assets are reliable and they deliver affordable energy. And that's what this industry, that's what Excel is struggling with right now. You know, putting investments into these older units that we know are not gonna be around for 10 years, but we still need them to be reliable. So how do we optimize that? How do we do that better? And that's really where asset performance management and digital transformation come in for us. You know, we're focusing on our critical fleet in our in our company where we need those plants to be reliable and we want to invest time and money into those plants to carry out APM to drive down cost in the long run so we can get through this energy transition that we're talking about. So specifically in energy supply, um, in our power plants, that's the business unit that I'm in. That's what I'm going to be talking with you about today. And we've narrowed in our scope to some of our key plants and units. So uh, 14 plants, 37 units, about 10,000 megawatts. Um, and that consists of combined cycle, simple cycle, and then our conventional fleet. Today, I'm not going to talk about nuclear. I'm not going to talk about transmission. 
However, this whole effort really is an enterprise level effort and we do have GE APM implementation going on in those other business areas as well. But for today, I'm focused on energy supply, specifically that scope you see down there at the bottom. All right, so again, let's, let's ground ourselves. You know, this audience knows what asset performance management is. But typically, when I talk about what we're doing, I'm talking within my organization with people that don't really have this background. And, and one big risk to a lot of what we're doing is that they think that we're implementing a software solution that's gonna fix their problems overnight. And, and what we constantly communicate is that asset performance management is a methodology. It's a series of principles, traditional equipment reliability and asset management principles that you then add a layer of digital transformation on top of. And that's where we have asset performance management. This is not new. This is very new to Excel. And so we constantly communicate, okay, what is APM? And why are we doing this? And this is not just the flavor of the month, and this is not a shiny object that we're going after. And the way that we describe that is we start on the left. So this is a continuous improvement cycle. But we start on the left with risk. Okay, the very first thing to this entire cycle is you need to know the criticality of your assets. Once you understand that, then you define what are the failure modes of those critical assets and then you can de develop and determine what that strategy is. So what condition monitoring are you gonna do? What time-based maintenance? What inspections? All of that should come from asset criticality and failure modes. You then execute that strategy in the field and towards the bottom of this wheel here, that's really where the power of APM comes in. Where you integrate a lot of these disparate data sources into one location and you perform analytics. You leverage technology to understand real-time equipment condition, real-time risk of your equipment, to then influence the decisions you make around investments and what maintenance you do. Again, our goal is the right maintenance on the right equipment at the right time. All right, that's gonna result in the lowest cost of maintenance in the long run. Now, this takes time to implement this, especially if you don't have a lot of these foundations in place, if you haven't already done asset criticality, if you don't already have defined strategies. Um, and so big focus for Excel has been building these programs and this methodology while also implementing kind of the digital transformation aspect at the same time. We leverage GE APM as our software application to help us do this. Um, we also have GE Smart Signal in our M&D center that we're utilizing. So let's talk about our timeline. Okay, so we actually have a pretty extensive history with Meridium um, over the last 15 years. Uh, my colleague, Tony McElvena, is actually gonna cover that history next in the next presentation to kind of talk about what we've done in history and what she has personally seen um, in, in the history of, of Meridium. I want to focus more on some key areas in our history and then specifically in the last three years since, since I've been involved and then where we're going. So back in 2014 is really when Excel made that first big step forward in utilizing data and analytics where we started up our M&D Center. Uh, that was a pilot effort for seven plants. It was very successful. They used GE Smart Signal, uh, and they expanded that to uh, 14 plants and 35 units in 2016. Now, fast forward to 2019. Okay, so this is important. This is a very important message that I want to give you guys right now. Excel went through a very large reorganization in our energy supply business unit. And in that reorganization, specifically of our engineering department, we consulted with, we got advice from consultants that have gone out to all these other larger utilities that um, have kind of been doing a lot of this in the past. And they gave us advice on what kind of organization you should have to be able to leverage data and leverage analytics. And coming out of that, we formed this analytics and practices organization that I'm the director of. That was an entirely new organization 
M&D came into that group, and then we formed another dedicated team under analytics and practices fully focused on uh, asset performance management and driving that through our organization and using data and analytics to optimize our decision making. So that's a, a team of about 10 people fully dedicated to everything that I'm talking about with you today. So I think I heard it yesterday. You know, you have to design your organization around the data, right? You have to have organizational alignment to make sure that you can carry out these processes and you can use this data. That is something that Excel did in 2019 and, it, and is a big reason why we're on the path that we are now. Okay, so then we had the organization in place. Then we were identifying, okay, where do we have gaps for this to be successful? And one of those was our, our software that we were currently using. So we were on Meridium version 3.5. We did an upgrade with GE to version 4.4 in 2020. Um, and then in 2021, uh, we had to accept a pretty honest truth that uh, we did not have asset criticality data. We did not have reliable asset criticality data. And so we took a year, we took a step back and we said, this is foundational, it's fundamental to everything that we're doing. We have to have this information. So we took a year and we performed asset criticality analysis across our fleet. We ranked about 200,000 assets um, and over half of them had changed in their classification from before. So that shows you that previous attempts to do this there wasn't time and dedication put towards it. There was no methodology to make sure that it was accurate and consistent. And that's something that we changed when we did this effort. All right, now in, in 2021, 2022 timeframe, we've been focused on integrating data and it's expanding instrumentation. Specifically in 2022, this year, starting in January to now, We've been focused on implementing that APM wheel that I talked about, and we're focused at a pilot site. So that's kind of something we do. You'll hear that a lot. We focus at a pilot site first, and then we expand. And so we took at this pilot site, it's a two by one combined cycle site. We took criticality. Then we defined all the actions, all the strategies linked to failure modes in GE APM. We then determined what is the monitoring strategy for all of these critical assets, and we're building the means to actually monitor that data, whether it's in M&D, whether it's in GE APM. And the final part of this implementation effort is really inserting the use of this software into routine practices that are already taking place, whether that's morning meetings, weekly planning meetings, uh, monthly risk review meetings. We want them, we want to put the data in front of the people that are making these decisions and utilize that on a regular basis. Um, so that was another part of this pilot effort. And so now expanding into the rest of this year and into next year, we're just doing that same thing, but at more sites. So we're expanding instrumentation and we're implementing APM, kind of a dedicated effort at each site. You know, one of the challenges that we've talked about in the last couple of days is user adoption and change management. We were trying to implement this more broadly across our fleet at the same time, and we were not gaining traction. We were not getting buy-in from people, and that's why we really focused on the pilot effort, and we realized we have to have dedicated pe people at each site working with them on a daily basis, implementing what we're doing here or we won't get user adoption. Um, so that's one thing that we did and we're, we'll continue to do moving forward. Into 2023, 2024, same thing. Instrumentation expansion, implementing APM, and integrating more data. All right, so let's talk about instrumentation expansion. Uh, again, started at a pilot site. Uh, we installed 144 wireless uh, vibration transmitters. Uh, we decided to go with the Bentley Nevada Ranger Pro sensors that are wireless. Uh, they've been really great for us so far. Uh, we also installed a handful of transmitters just for process conditions, temperatures, pressures, so on and so forth. And then we installed a gas chromatograph. The goal here was we 
We targeted critical assets where we had failure modes that we could not detect for. And then if we monitored them better, we could either reduce failures or eliminate unnecessary, unnecessary time-based maintenance. Moving into, uh, well, the rest of this year and into next year, we've expanded that to two additional sites. So a, a big focus is wireless vibration, but we're also moving on to more motor monitoring. We're finding that we do have uh, a lot of motors in our fleet that are failing, and we don't have a lot of good maintenance practices on those motors. Uh, so we want to be able to monitor them better. Um, so we're focused on getting current and voltage data, as, as well as uh, we're piloting an iris partial discharge monitoring system. In the next year, we want to pilot online lube oil monitoring and then permanently installed cameras uh, for thermal imaging. All right, so what are we doing with this data? The big goal of all this instrumentation expansion is to get the, the data to our M&D center, right? That, their predictive analytics technologies are key to help us to identify failures early. However, in APM, we want a single pane of glass for the end user to see all the relevant data on their equipment so they can make more informed decisions. And so we've been working with GE on this to really expand some of their general content to meet our needs. And we have now what we call the, our equipment health monitoring workflow. You can see there are seven different categories um, listed. And those seven categories essentially roll up to calculate an overall asset health index score. And so those categories, the first one is preventative maintenance. So we look at, we connect to our SAP system and we bring over work order information. And we're looking at PMs that are overdue and we're looking at PM compliance. Those two together calculate an overall preventative maintenance score. Similar with corrective maintenance. We're looking at you know, number of work orders that are open that are corrective or breakdown maintenance. And where have we been closing out a lot of these breakdown type work orders, indicating there might be something going on with this asset? Next category is OSI Pi. This one is really where we're bringing in a lot of our data. So we do not have a traditional data lake in our company, at least in energy supply. Uh, we have elected to kind of utilize OSI Pi as that means to get data into M&D and into APM. So where we have data sources out there, we're connecting OSI Pi to that and we're bringing the data in that way. And so process data, you know, stuff from our control systems, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, but we also bring on online vibration monitoring. So all of those wireless sensors that we added those communicate back to our local System 1 servers, Bentley Nevada System 1 servers, that we connect Pi to. And now we bring that data continuously into APM and into our M&D center. Oil analysis. We have internal oil labs in our company. Um, and anytime a, a chemist uh, runs the results of a, a sample and loads them into their local database, We've connected Pi to those databases and we bring the data through Pi. So we created a, essentially a Pi tag uh, for every single oil sample parameter in our oil samples. And then we set limits in, in APM for that. I'll show you an example of that here shortly. And then finally, thermal performance is another one in OSI Pi, uh, where our MND center now is doing more thermal performance monitoring uh, they have models in their software applications to calculate heat rate, turbine efficiencies, pump performance, and the outputs of that go to Pi, and, and then we bring those into APM. Next category is APM recommendations. Uh, so if, if recommendations are open for greater than 90 days, it'll influence that score a little bit. The next one's rounds. So Everything that I've talked about so far is kind of in blue. So blue means we are using that today, the functionality exists today. Now you're gonna to start to see some, 
some purple and some green, which is scope for this year and scope into next year. Um, but operator rounds is a big focus for us. We're doing a pilot right now where we're building all the operator rounds for that two by one site in Rounds Pro. And the goal is as an operator identifies an issue in the field that comes automatically into this workflow and it influences the round score. We're gonna expand that to our entire fleet next year. Thermography, route-based vibration collection, um, acoustic surveys, those are some other opportunities for us to get data into APM through the Rounds Pro module. The next one is predictive diagnostics. So this is another big one for us. So we are on-prem, both in our M&D center with Smart Signal and in APM, and we've worked with GE to build an interface between those two. So anytime an M&D um, engineer opens up a case or an advisory on an asset, it automatically comes into GE APM, and then you receive a score for that category based on those cases that are open on the asset. And then the last one's in green. We're working with GE to add this right now, and this is really interfacing the data from the integrity module into equipment health. So if we have inspections that we're doing in inspection manager, uh, we want the results of those inspections to come into this entire picture. Okay, so each category then receives a score, each category gets a weight, and together those roll up to calculate that asset health index score. We combine that with asset criticality to get to operational risk. Okay, are you still awake? That was a lot of information. But I think it's important to understand this, right? Because it's, there's a lot that goes into the background of all this. It's a lot of data we're bringing in. Uh, so I wanted to get down to the details for you guys so that you knew about that. All right, so let's look in GE APM now. So we have a series of dashboards, part of our equipment health monitoring workflow. And this is an example of a heat map that's on one of those dashboards. It's showing you that asset health index score from zero to 100. And you, know, you can see over on the left, those are lower scores, more red. You can filter this uh, based on uh, a plant or a unit or a system. And you can get down to see you know, what assets need your attention and why. You can click in, and this is an example of what you'll see. So this is a boiler feed pump with actual data that we have coming in. Um, and over on the left there, those are those categories that I was talking about. And so the first one there is the OSI Pi health indicator category. Again, that's where we're bringing a lot of our important data into APM. And it's in alert right now. It has a score of zero out of 100. And if you click into that, you can see over on the right uh, all the data that we're looking at. So we're looking at um, HPIP efficiencies and de deviation in those efficiencies. Uh, we're looking at vibration levels on this pump. We're looking at temperatures of the bearings and the thrust bearings. You can see that our HPIP efficiency deviations are in warning. So you can click into that. You can see the data, you can see the limits, and you can actually trend it. Uh, so it's pretty neat functionality. Below that, the predictive diagnostics health indicator is the next category, and it has a score of 60 out of 100, and it's in warning. Again, you can click into that, and you can see at the bottom that we have a case opened up from our M&D center on this pump that the thrust position has increased, and it's greater than what it had been in the past. That's another data point for us to kind of understand what's going on with this pump and the overall health of this pump. Some other examples. Uh, so as I mentioned, we bring in all of our oil data now into APM. So over on the left, those are just a handful of some of the parameters that you would see in an oil sample result. And then we set limits around those, and you can see what's in alert, what's in warning, and what's normal. And again, you can click into those and trend the data. The top right, that's our wireless vibration data. So this is a circ water pump motor. Uh, you can see for one motor, with our new wireless instruments, we're bringing in eight parameters for that one motor. 
And you can see that we've got the overall um, inboard vertical velocity is an alert. Again, you can click into that and you can trend it and you can understand what's going on. One thing that many of you probably have been experiencing if you're trying to install wireless instrumentation is there's a lot of skepticism out there, right? Our, our INC techs that are used to wired instrumentation, reliable instrumentation, the idea of implementing wireless technology is not popular. It's, it's really come a long ways, and we've been trying to prove that to people, but we also want to put some tools in front of them to help manage that job a little bit more in the, in the future. So these wireless sensors, uh, they bring back battery health as a data point. So we bring that into Pi, and we've actually created a dashboard for them so they can see, here's all of my sensors, my wireless sensors out in the field, and here's my battery health, so that you have some warning if batteries are starting to decline and you need to plan to repair them. Um, so far, after a year, and we're collecting data at a 10-minute interval, all of our batteries are 75% or above. Uh, so we've seen some pretty good results with this so far. All right. So now we take our equipment health information and we combine it with asset criticality to understand what we call operational risk. And so we didn't want to have a bunch of dashboards out there that are just showing you equipment that's in poor condition because that doesn't really help you prioritize the work that you do, right? You might have let's say an important asset that's in really poor condition and a critical asset that's in really poor condition and you don't know how to prioritize those unless you look at risk. And so that's what we've built. Um, we did see that as a gap with the standard GE APM offering and so we worked with them to build some, some dashboards that then combine equipment health data and criticality data to understand risk. And so the top heat map widget, uh, that is from one of our dashboards that we've created at a plant level. And so you can filter this plant dashboard down to a unit system, all the way down to an asset. And you can see within that filter criteria what your top risks are for that facility. I don't know if you can see here. That's the asset health index score right there that we were talking about previously, it's a numeric value. This one right next to it is asset criticality. So we have a numeric asset criticality value that we can then apply to the numeric uh, health data point and calculate a numeric risk value. And then we have a risk classification. Um, and then again, it allows you to see a prioritized list of risk at your plants. We've then decided that you know, the way that our company is structured, we really need to focus on getting resources to the right places within a region, whether that's people or funding. Uh, so we decided to take our risk information and add another level of criticality on top of that to separate units and plants within a region. So we have asset criticality, and then we applied a unit criticality factor on top of our units in a region to then understand what are my highest risks within a region, not necessarily just within a plant. And that's what you see down below. You can see plant A, B, C listed, and you can see what are the highest risks within that region. So one thing that we have been struggling with is we've spent a lot of time building you know, everything that I've talked about so far, getting the data where it needs to go, building models around this data. But the challenging aspect of this is how do we use the data, right? How do we make sure that we have some process or workflow in place where people can use this data and it actually informs decisions so we can get value out of what we're doing? And so that's something that we've been focused on here in the last several months. And this is kind of a diagram to show you what we're starting to adopt. Um, very similar to what I've talked about so far, we have a lot of different data sources coming into 
GEAPM equipment health. We combine that with criticality, and then we populate that as risk information on a series of dashboards. You just saw the operational risk dashboards. We also have what we call a daily O&M dashboard. Um, and we use those in those routine work processes. So if you have a daily plant meeting with your all plant staff, those dashboards come up in the morning and we talk about any new risks that have been identified in the last 24 hours. Uh, weekly planning and scheduling, right? We can look at what are our top risks that are out there so we can prioritize maintenance for next week. And then we have monthly reliability meetings where uh, our reliability engineering team works with plant management to communicate top risks and what we're doing to mitigate those risks. Those are the dashboards that we're using to facilitate a lot of those discussions now. Again, we partnered with our reliability engineering organization. These are our plant engineers on site that are gonna review this information on a regular basis and have a good handle of equipment condition and risk so that we can get GEAPM recommendations created to kind of kickstart the next processes to make sure that our investments are prioritized correctly based on this data, to make sure that our weekly work is prioritized correctly based on this data. That reliability engineering partnership with our team is very critical for this workflow to be successful. So let's talk about some use cases. Uh, this is, they're very simple use cases, but the idea is to kind of show you how this workflow works. So here's an example where our M&D center identified uh, reduced seal oil differential pressure on one of our generators. That data went into GEAPM, into the health model, we combined it with criticality, and then it was populating as a high risk on the operational risk dashboards. Now, this information is already communicated to the plant in separate means. Um, I think you might have heard Jonathan talk about that yesterday. It's either a, a phone call to the operations or it's part of like a weekly call and report where they discuss, here's some of your new M&D cases. You know, what should we do about this? We're starting to see the potential of APM to help streamline that process and that workflow. And so the reliability engineer saw this as a high risk on the dashboard. He knew what the problem was and was able to create a recommendation to adjust the uh, seal oil pressure regulator. That then created an SAP notification automatically and based on the criticality and the priority that was put into that, it was prioritized correctly in our normal work management process. That differential pressure was adjusted and then uh, it was discussed in our monthly risk review meeting. The M&D engineer closed the case and the risk was removed from the dashboard. So that kind of shows you how that kind of went full circle. Previously, a lot of this was taking place with emails and PDF reports that now we kind of have a database to keep track of all this and know, okay, this recommendation is linked to this risk. This is what we're doing about this and we can keep track of it moving forward. Another example um, here is our gland steam exhauster fan and motor on one of our units. We added wireless instrumentation uh, to the fan and motor assembly. That data went into our local system one server we connected it to Pi, and we brought it into APM. We set limits around that, and the vibration was excessive. We combined it with criticality, and it was populating as a medium risk on the dashboard. The engineer then took that information, worked with our vibration SME to diagnose it further, added stiffening to the structure to reduce the vibration levels, but then ended up creating a recommendation for our long-term risk mitigation, which was replacing bearings, replacing the coupling, and realigning the fan and motor assembly. That then created an SAP notification, and it is now being worked through our normal 
overhaul planning process and our normal work management process to get prioritized based on this data. All right, so lessons learned. Okay, I have that first one starred for you. I've kind of already emphasized this, but organizational alignment is very, very important. And you need to make sure that you have a lot of your foundations in place. Unfortunately, you can't cut a lot of corners. You can't skip a lot of steps. You know, our leadership wants this as fast as possible, but we've had to accept the truth that we have to take some time to make sure we put foundations in place. And we're still working through a lot of that around our data quality and our data structure. This is a transformational effort, okay? It's gonna take a lot of culture change, change management. Uh, you need dedicated resources and it's gonna take multi, it's a multi-year effort, okay? This doesn't happen overnight. You need support from senior leadership. Uh, that is something that we absolutely have within Excel, all the way up to our CEO and our COO. Uh, they constantly want to hear about this. They want to know what we're doing. They're excited about it. They see the potential in it. Because of that, we get the support, the funding, and the resources that we need. So that's very important to make sure you have that support. We elected to start with a pilot. We think that's a, a good uh, thing to do, to start small, learn from that, and then expand afterwards. Another thing that we found at our pilot site is you know, previous to that, it was the, the analytics team was the one that was out there communicating to people all the great things that APM does for them. Now, their peers are starting to talk about, hey, this is what APM did for me as a plant manager. This is what APM did for me as a reliability engineer. And so it comes from their peers and not some central organization. And that's another great way to gain some momentum and to get some adoption. Data integration, uh, I'm not on the IT side, I'm on the business side. Don't ask me any IT questions because I don't know the answer. Um, but data integration takes a lot of time. It's a lot of work, especially when your data structures are inconsistent. You don't have a data lake already set up. Uh, that has created a lot of inefficiencies and time for us to map data and integrate data. Measure the success and communicate frequently. This is not something that I've done a very good job at, uh, but it is very important, right? It's not the glorious part of the job trying to come up with what are the savings that you're getting from this effort, but at the end of the day, it is very important to keep that leadership support and have a robust communication plan in place if you change leadership. Uh, so it's important to keep track of those savings and communicate those. And then the last one here, um, this one's a bit of a sensitive subject for me and for Excel. You know, we do have some data quality problems. Uh, we have some data structure problems. But it can't stop us, right? We can't stop and wait to fix all of these issues before we move forward. Now, we're trying to solve some of these problems in parallel, but it, you can't just stop and wait for everything to be perfect before you move forward. Um, and so that's something that we've learned. We need to address some of these foundational issues, uh, but we're still moving forward because we know we're gonna get value out of what we're doing. If we can fix these data issues, we're just gonna get more value. So that's why we're going after that in parallel. Questions for me on what we're doing? A lot of questions, but the one that came to mind immediately is how do you, how do you manage setting the thresholds for alerts and the noise that comes with that and tweaking those over time? Yeah, the, that is a challenge for, for sure. Um, we kind of started applying like standard limits, you know, so around like vibration, um, we're looking at what are the industry standards around what those limits should be. And then when we do more of a dedicated like APM implementation effort at a site, we start to refine those limits specific for the asset. And a lot of it is kind of learning over time. You know, if we're seeing that we're getting a lot of nuisance issues where our, our alarm limits aren't set right, then we change those. Um, but the way APM works is you, you have the ability to look at 
averages in the last 24 hours. You can look at the highest last value, the lowest last value, I think. Um, so there's a, diff a couple different ways to manage that. One thing that we've found is APM is not great for transient operation where your data is going to change significantly if you're operating at different variables or different process conditions, or if you start and stop equipment often. And so the way we have it built, if you shut down equipment and start it back up, it's going to populate as a new risk because when it was shut down, everything looked good. When it started back up, then everything went into warning or alert because it's vibrating. We've been struggling with how to manage that. And what we're probably going to find is those sorts of situations, we're not going to monitor hard limits in APM. We're going to let our M&D center handle that. And then we focus on other things like oil limits and, and some of these more static data points that make more sense to have thresholds built around. OK, so excellent journey. We, we all must be in somewhere in that journey. So. I'm sure you must have so many solutions like lubrication management and criticality assessment, strategy, so many things. Were you making those solutions or G was supporting you make those solutions? And how was solutions made? How did you present to your management? And who were the stakeholders? Uh, I mean, there must be operations, manage, maintenance, project, technical. Who were the guys gave you tough time? Yeah, so again, we're still pretty early on in this journey. If you think about what I just talked about, we've done a lot of this at one site. Now we're starting to really expand that, and we're just really starting to get in to use this and see the value from it. And so some of these things, like recommendation management process, we're not quite there yet. We're just trying to get people to use recommendations. Um, however, our reliability engineering team that is part of our large engineering organization that, that ANP is also part of, we partner with them very closely on a lot of this. So we make a lot of those decisions together because we're the kind of the key users of this information and this program. Um, but operations, plant management, they're also stakeholders in a lot of this. So the pilot site was actually defining a lot of these processes and programs and what it's going to look like. And that was a very, very close partnership with the plant personnel. Um, we also, we do work with GE. We get advice from them on uh, you know, what to do, what not to do. Uh, early on, we didn't take their advice and learn that uh, yeah, you have to do strategies. You can't skip that step. Uh, so we, we've learned that they've got some good advice for us as well. And then also in the industry. So, you know, working with other, other companies that are farther along in this journey, we're starting to learn from them to understand what some of those programs and processes look like. I hope that answered your question. Did I get opposition? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is difficult for people, right? We'll, we'll come in and talk to them about what we're doing, and they don't see a need for it. They see that two things. What they're doing is working, but then also they don't have enough time because they're focused on breakdown maintenance. And so you have to explain how those connect to each other that what you're doing right now isn't necessarily wrong, but with the resources that you have now, you can't do it efficiently and be proactive. And that's where this helps. It helps put information in front of you so we can be more proactive. But yes, there is a lot of opposition that, that we've received, but having dedicated time with those people and showing them what we're doing, I think goes a long ways. Thanks for presenting, Katie. I think around similar questions, but as you grow and implement rounds and other modules, are you, I guess the question is around, how do you sustain what you've already implemented and grow simultaneously? Yeah, so when analytics and practices that organization was formed, 
we didn't have a good understanding of how much work we would have to put into building all of this and building the programs. And so we're spending the majority of our time building, 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 right? And we're adding more, da more data every day. Now we're realizing that we still do need to modify our organization slightly. We need to have resources to sustain all of what we're talking about and to use the data, right? So in each region, we have one SME on vibration. If you think about all the data that we have coming in now for that pilot site, that's like a full-time job for that person just to keep track of all the equipment that is vibrating a lot and diagnosing it. And so we're finding that we're gonna have to build up our condition monitoring program to use this data more, not collect data in the field, but actually diagnose and use the data and take action on it. Um, and then we're gonna have to have people to sustain everything that we build, even asset criticality, right? Now we have this huge database. Who's in charge of that data? It's kind of fallen on our team, but we got to have the resources to do that. So we are looking at adding more resources. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, your, sh your sharing your successful digital transformation journey. Uh, I have a question. What does m and uh, refer to? And is it a centralized center, or it's located in every? Sorry, I'm uh, having a hard time hearing you. I don't know if we can turn up the mic or. Sorry. My yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, you are sharing your successful journey with the digital uh, digital transformation. Uh, my question is, what is M and D refer to, and is it a centralized center or it's an all power plant? Can you repeat what what stands for? Sorry. M and D. M and D. &D sorry, monitoring and diagnostic center. Okay, and uh, is that a centralized uh, center? Yes. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. How many resources did you use to do your AC ACA studies? Hmm. Um, so we actually hired a consultant to do the facilitation. So we hired a contractor that worked with each site. And depending on the size of the site, it might have taken four weeks to do, it might have taken 12 weeks to do. Um, and then we had a really knowledgeable operator in the room, really knowledgeable INC tech, typically, and then either an electrician or an engineer that would support some of the other equipment. Um, and they were in a room for eight hours a day for many weeks. And also, how do you push the priority that you're calculating in your asset health index over to SAP so they know how to prioritize the work order on that side? Yeah, so um, our criticality data is in SAP. Priority is a manual field you populate when you create the recommendation. And we have definitions around that and, and we need to align that with our health definitions and our risk de definitions to make sure the priority is populated correctly. Uh, but right now, we rely on a manual input there. Hey. Hello. Okay. I have one question. Have you already identified the new set of assets that you're planning out of the pilot that you want to add the can, to, Sorry, to can you speak up a little? Hello. Have you already identified the new set of assets that you're going to add to the monitoring? And are you planning to add new parameters or variables on that matter or different operational modes as well? Yeah, so that's part of the APM implementation effort. So, you know, as you're defining strategies and you're looking at your critical failure modes and your critical assets, then the goal is let's get the monitoring in place to monitor those. And uh, we do it essentially a gap analysis to determine what instrumentation do we need to add to, to really target those critical failure modes. Um, and then where we have found that we have like critical balance of plant equipment, like closed cooling water pumps, that were never really part of like M&D, M&D's radar originally, because it's not a big complex piece of equipment, but it's very critical. And so we've been adding instrumentation to a lot of that type of equipment and getting it into M&D. Um, so yes, the goal is everything I talked to about today and within our M&D center, 
at least all of our critical assets, all of the critical failure modes that we can detect will be monitored. So you probably will have cases where you have to install instrumentation just to be able to monitor, correct? Yes, yep. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. All right, good morning, Katie. Um, question, you had said that you have the core group, headquarters focus group, M&D focus group, that then interfaces with more of the reliability and the re more of your site-specific uh, asset performance group. Different reporting structure, I, I gather? They all roll up to the same senior director. Okay. So how is that relationship between headquarters when you're going out and then interfacing with those reliability uh, engineers? Even though it all rolls up into one, there's still sort of yeah. a separation uh, there. It's improving and growing currently. Um, our reliability engineering group, so I, I came from essentially that group originally. I was a plant engineer. We had four plant engineers at one of our large combined cycle sites. When we went through a reorg and we formed this analytics and practices team, we reduced the amount of engineers on site and moved them to more central roles. But a lot still falls downhill to those reliability plant engineers. And in fact, they are maintenance engineers. They're not reliability engineers. They're focused on day-to-day -day maintenance and troubleshooting. So they, they've constantly told us, we don't even have time to look at these screens, right? and get into this data and look at it, that there's no way I can do that. I'm focused on getting parts ordered, I'm focused on fixing this equipment that's broken in front of me. And so we've been working with them very closely to, you know, it's not gonna work if we just say, well, too bad, you gotta do more work, right? We know that that doesn't work. So we're adding resources to that organization that are dedicated, traditional reliability engineers where APM is gonna be their focus. And so they're going to be expected, and their scorecard items are going to reflect utilization of this and being more proactive in what we do. And then we let the maintenance engineers, the previous engineers, focus on the stuff that they're very busy with. So we're, we're adding resources, and because of that, we're getting more buy-in. It's like, okay, if, if you're going to actually dedicate people to doing this, we see that this is going to work, and that partnership has grown. Thank you. Uh, so can you speak a little bit about the, how you continuously optimize? Like, uh, do you have you users of asset strategy and you go back and optimize? I saw a lot of good things about the intelligence piece and dynamic risk monitoring, but what about optimization? Thank you. So that is our end goal, is sustaining this and constantly optimizing it. We, in the last couple of years, have focused on building everything that you see here. So just getting the foundation in place that we can then optimize later. Uh, so that pilot site, we've built over 1,300 strategies for our critical assets. What we do, though, it kind of in parallel with all this, is we routinely review failure data. That is one of our core responsibilities. And so we have a lot of dashboards in APM. We, we now have the failure elimination workflow to identify where we have bad actors. Um, and then we work with our, our other organizations to implement corrective actions more across our fleet to make sure that we're taking care of those. So like I mentioned, motor failures. We've seen in our data that we do have a lot of motor failures. So, okay, we're not doing something right. We're either not maintaining them right or we're not monitoring them. And so now we're focused on getting more monitoring in place and now looking at the motors we can't monitor, it's either run to failure or we do time-based maintenance. And so we're now starting to implement some of those things. So, so we're trying to do some of it in parallel, but the majority of our time is actually building a lot of what you heard today. Okay. All right, thank you all.